Hi, my name is Phil and I am a senior lecturer in astrophysics and welcome to this video. Basically what I want to do is discuss if you get to name a planet, if you discover it. Now as an astrophysicist I have been involved in the discovery of some planets and I'm going to discuss do you get to put your name to them if you discover something like this. So the ones that I've actually been involved with here are, well they were discovered with the test telescope and it was between two stars and I say I've been involved with these were very large groups of other astronomers. I was kind of there at the beginning when they were first discovered, first detected and then we kind of just basically part, part of a big group that did lots of just observations and stuff like that. But I was partly involved in the bit that initially detected them with tests and the light curves and how they were kind of detected through the transit. So there's actually three planets around one star and then another planet around another star by another group. But anyway, I've been involved in the actual discovery of new exoplanets, which is planets orbiting other stars. And again, this was using the TESS Space Telescope, which is designed to look for new planets. It's just looking at lots of stars all at the same time. And we're looking for dips in brightness of the star as a planet passes in front of it. Now, as it passes in front, it blocks light out, we can then detect the planet, and that's how these planets were basically detected. So these ones that I was involved with here, you've got on the um, left hand side there, you've got one star around, well the star is called TOI 276, and there was three basically hot young sub-Neptonians there. They're basically in between the size of Earth, and Neptune, they're on quite short orbital periods. So if you have a look kind of on the, the right hand side there, they're orbiting anywhere from like 10 to 17 days. So they're very close to the star. They're quite warm, hot, and they're quite large. They're in between you know, Earth and Neptune size. So big, big-ish planets, hot planets, not habitable. Very young. These were very young planets, which was quite interesting. So they're still kind of in the very early phase uh, after the formation. And then around the other star, so TOI 1807 was one very hot lava world, so like a terrestrial planet that is suspected to have basically a surface of molten lava. So interesting world that is. And that one orbits, I think it's around about 10 hours it takes to go around its star, so that's very, very close to its star, which is why it's so hot. So let's have a look at the names of those planets then. So they're pretty boring. TOI 276b, same again that C, D, and then TOI 1807b. You can probably start to see where that name's come from because I've told you the names of the stars already, but they're really boring names. There's not something exciting like someone's name there. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the scientific de designation for a planet then and explain how they actually kind of get their name. So they get a scientific designation. A classific or not a classification, but they get a name scientifically. So these are uh, just some random names here. I don't even know if these actually exist. I've just made up some names here. So TOI, 27OB, you've got a Kepler one there. This is the sort of name that you'd expect for an exoplanet that's just been discovered. So how does it actually get that name? Well, most of the time, the first part is the name of the star. So the host star that the planet is orbiting, or it's the astronomical catalogue name. So you've got lots and lots of catalogues of stars. So you've got the HD one, and I can't remember what the HD stands for. You can let me know in the comments if you can remember. I should probably have checked before this video. Um, and then it'll get a number. So it's in some catalogue, and then it'll have some number in that catalogue, basically of when it was observed. That'll be like the star's name in the catalogue. Uh, or if the star is kind of an important star, a named star, it'll take the name of the star. So Proxima Centauri is our nearest star. So it actually has a proper name and that planet will take its name of its host star and then the other one will be the catalogue name. Okay, so that very first part of that. Or if it's not any of those, it could actually be the scientific instrument or the project that was actually used to discover the exoplanet. So the Kepler, that's the Kepler Space Telescope. TOI is a test, well, yeah, a test object of interest from the test telescope. So it's one of those two. It's either the name of the star or it's name of the telescope or instrument that then discovered it. But that's the first part of the name that a planet will get. Now, 
the next part is going to be a number. Now this will either be the number in the scientific instrument or the project or the catalogue, for example. So Kepler 16, that would mean that it's probably like the 16th one discovered, essentially, um, in that particular catalogue. Same again here. So it, it's the number in that scientific instrumental project that you get. So it's a pretty logical numbering and naming system, essentially. So that would be, but again, this is the name of the star. So Kepler 16 is the star, if remember that. So the Kepler, part, Kepler Space Telescope, that was what was used to do, discover this particular one. And just out of interest, Kepler 16 is a dual star system. Quite exciting. I'll let you investigate that a little bit more. So Kepler 16b is the Kepler Space Telescope. TOI are test objects of interest. So this is where you've probably had an interesting signal. It's an object of interest, so it's called TOI. And the TESS telescope is a transiting exoplanet survey satellite in space, same as Kepler, really, doing the similar sort of thing. I suppose it's basically taken over from Kepler, really. So, again, this is what that refers to. Now, the very last part then refers to the actual planet itself. So now we're on to the actual planet. The very first parts are referring to the actual star, the host star that it's actually orbiting. So here we've got B. That end letter tells you that actually we're talking about the planet orbiting Proxima Centauri B or HD 219666. So B, we've got our planet. Now B would be the first planet and then C would be the second planet. So Proxima Centauri B means it's the first planet that's been detected around Proxima Centauri. It doesn't mean it's the closest to that star. It just means the first one to be detected, which can get a bit confusing because you, maybe you'll have, maybe Proxima Centauri D is the closest, but it's it's not the first one to be detected, okay? So why does it not start at A? Always starts at B. Well, the star is class or is called A, but it's a capital A. So Proxima Centauri and then the capital A, that would be the actual main star. And then Proxima Centauri B, lowercase b, is the actual planet. So it never starts at lowercase a because that's what would be the a is denoting the actual star. Now, if it's a double star, triple star, then it gets a bit more complex because you have star a and star b, star c, but they are uppercase. Right. So there you go. Stars are always uppercase like that. And it could be for multiple star systems, a, b, c. And your planets are then going to be lowercase starting from the b. And it will just continue until you've got all of those planets in that system. And yeah, as I mentioned before, it's not their distance from the star. So I believe, I think this is Trappist 1. I should again, should have checked before the video. I think this is because what we've we got here seven planets. They all kind of look terrestrial, like yeah, I reckon this is Trappist 1. And it's the order in which they were found or discovered. So if you look here, it goes B, D, G, F, E, C, H. Oh, sounds bizarre ordering it like that, but that's when they were discovered. And it's likely that they were easier to discover. So B was easy to detect because it's a big, pla well, it's, it's one of the bigger ones there. It's closest to the star. Why is closest easy to detect? Well, it passes in front of its star more often as a shorter orbital period. Um, C looks like it's a big one as well, so that would pass in front of its star and block out a lot of light. G, if you have a look at that, G and H are quite small, so it makes sense they would have been detected last. So it's on when they were detected, not their distance from the star. That you letter get, you get your letter. Now, unfortunately, you don't get to assign your name to an exoplanet. It just doesn't happen. It takes the scientific name. Really boring, I know. So, you, you know, you go out, you discover a new planet, you're not going to get your name associated with it, unfortunately. However, if you're really set on having your name associated with an astronomical object, go and discover a comet. Pretty much most comets will be assigned the discoverer's name. And I'm going to do a separate video on that explaining the naming of comets, but they will quite often take the discoverer's name. So go out there, get your telescope out and go and discover a comet, and maybe you can have your name associated with an astronomical object. So thank you for watching. Now, if you do enjoy these videos and you find them helpful, do consider becoming a member. There's extra videos in the member section. It also helps generally support the channel so I can make these videos for you. So thank you for watching.